Hello and welcome to the best of Larry Barker Investigates. Over the next hour, we will see some of the best investigations of 2022. The stories expose abuse, neglect, and potentially deadly situations. Let's get started with a story from March involving a high-ranking officer in the Albuquerque Police Department. And now he pocketed tens of thousands of dollars and nobody at APD noticed. It's huge. I mean, this, this puts a black eye on APD. There's no doubt about it. There was something going on here that is totally disturbing. Yet again, there's another APD overtime abuse scandal, and that's what this is. It's an issue that's plagued Albuquerque police for years. Since 2014, there have been a half dozen investigations into APD abuse of overtime. Last year, following the seventh probe in eight years, state well, auditor so Brian Cologne blasted APD for failure to take corrective action. Time and time again, leadership at APD and the city of Albuquerque clearly ignored the findings that were presented in those six prior audits and reports. Enough's enough. The city of Albuquerque and APD have got to get it right. Police officials vowed a crackdown on overtime. Privately, however, police officials were hiding a troubling secret. It involved internal affairs investigations, high-level wrongdoing, disciplinary action, an officer firing, and overtime misdeeds that built APD out of tens of thousands of dollars. Is it fair to call this a shameful chapter in APD's history? Yes, and I, I'm embarrassed that for the department in this stage, it definitely is shameful. Former police chief Mike Geyer reviewed the internal affairs investigation. From what I reviewed, I mean, these were almost daily occurrences um, going, you know, seven days a week, 24-7. I would say that it definitely is the worst I've seen. But on so many different levels, this is wrong. How does this happen in the chief's office? It happens because nobody's held accountable. The buck doesn't stop with anybody. It just gets passed around. Tom Grover is an attorney and former APD officer. He reviewed the case files. It's as big a deal as you can get because that's the issue, is that there's indifference to wrongdoing, especially at the higher levels. To understand what happened, we need to go back to early 2020 and the first days of the pandemic. Lieutenant Jim Edison is brought in to lead APD's COVID response. Working out of the chief's office, Edison was responsible for coordinating testing, contact tracing, stats, emails, and phone calls. Over the course of one year on the job, Lieutenant Edison earned almost a quarter of a million dollars. That's more than the police chief, the mayor, even the governor. How did he pull it off? Well, he cheated on his overtime, lining his pockets with illicit pay practically every day for a year. And even though Edison flagrantly violated a host of rules, regulations, and policies, APD's brass signed off on it simply looking the other way. From April 2020 to April 2021, Edison claimed $133,000 in dubious overtime payments. Call-out overtime is paid to off-duty officers who are called back to work outside the regular shift. For example, if there's a murder at 2 a.m., the homicide detective who goes to the crime scene will be paid time and a half for reporting to duty in the middle of the night. Lieutenant Edison's job in the chief's office was primarily administrative desk work. However, on a daily basis, even weekends, the lieutenant padded his pay with thousands of hours in what's known as call-out overtime. For example, every time Edison listened to a voicemail and sent it to somebody else to investigate, he claimed two hours overtime. On January 8, 2021, Edison went to Lowe's and took an hour overtime. January 13, he claimed a half-hour OT to find out who parked in a deputy chief's parking place. Saturday, January 16th, his day off, Edison hit up APD 12 hours in time and a half call out overtime for making phone calls and sending emails. January 22nd, the lieutenant documented seven minutes of off-duty work 
and claimed eight hours overtime. Sunday, January 31, Edison accounted for 22 minutes of work and claimed 10 and a half hours overtime. Tuesday, February 2nd, the lieutenant emailed some stats to a deputy chief and claimed two hours OT. The list goes on and on, practically every day for a full year. Were Lieutenant Edison's duties consistent with earning call-out overtime? No, they weren't. So in essence, he was creating his own overtime cash register. He abused his position for his own enrichment. That's totally abuse of conduct. That's not overtime call-out. That's overtime abuse. A social media post launched an internal affairs investigation. Among the findings, Lieutenant Edison violated rules, regulations, and codes of conduct by cheating on his overtime. He was handed a two-week suspension. And after he continued to misrepresent his time, there was a second IA investigation. In October, Lieutenant Jim Edison was fired. Now, the lieutenant supervisor was Deputy Chief Mike Smathers. Even though Edison's overtime clearly violated department policy, Smathers signed off on the inappropriate pay anyway. Based on the uh, documents that you've reviewed, what did he do that was wrong? At best, he failed to supervise. At worst, he's incompetent to hold his position because he just was ambivalent about it or didn't even recognize the abuse that was going on. Internal affairs investigators concluded Deputy Chief Smathers violated multiple rules and regulations by failing to review Edison's timesheets. Smathers received a one-day suspension. I'm appalled. I, I couldn't believe it when I first read it. Uh, Deputy Chief receiving that minimal di uh, disciplinary action for such major offenses just boggles my mind. In the second internal affairs probe, investigators concluded Smathers again violated APD policy. He was handed a written reprimand. It was an appropriate discipline for those violations. Eric Garcia is the acting superintendent for police reform. Chief Smathers took responsibility. He did not give misleading statements. He was truthful. He admitted he should have done more. Up here on the fifth floor of the police department. We're so busy that to go through the fine details of looking through somebody's timesheets is not something that, that, uh, that we're going to be carving out time for. Jim Edison deceived Deputy Chief Smathers and Deputy Chief Smathers took accountability for that and uh, was disciplined. It's extremely concerning, extremely concerning. Louis Sanchez is a retired APD officer and an Albuquerque City Councilor. If we have had seven investigations and we still can't get it right, then something is definitely broken within the system. It's our job to ask those questions as city councilors, as a checks and balances system, to make sure that the public's money is being spent the right way. Deputy Chief Mike Smathers declined to be interviewed. Jim Edison did not respond to our request for an interview. The case has been referred to an outside agency for a criminal investigation. The former APD cop has not been asked to repay the department. So why should we care if a ranking police officer cheats on his overtime? Because first it's their tax dollars being wasted. But significantly, and I think more importantly, it has to do with the integrity of the people running the state's largest police department. Larry Barker, KRQE, News 13. In October, there were surprising new developments in the case involving the lieutenant who had been fired over the overtime scandal. Well, wait a minute, that doesn't really ring true to me. How would you possibly do that? never seen anything like this, but somebody did something wrong. It is a well-documented case of high-level wrongdoing at the Albuquerque Police Department. While assigned to the chief's office, Lieutenant Jim Edison pocketed tens of thousands of dollars in illicit overtime. In a 12-month period, the lieutenant was paid almost a quarter of a million dollars. That's more than the police chief, even the mayor. It began in 2020. 
after Lieutenant Edison was tapped to lead APD's COVID-19 response. His duties included coordinating testing, contact tracing, compiling stats, and responding to virus-related emails and phone calls. Even though it was basically a day shift desk job, Lieutenant Edison padded his pay with thousands of hours in time and a half call out overtime. Now, a homicide detective receives OT when they respond after hours to a crime scene. Lieutenant Edison claimed call out overtime for after hours emails and phone calls. He told a supervisor he was allowed two hours call out overtime for any phone call he received outside regular working hours. For example, Saturday, January 16th last year, Edison hit up taxpayers 12 hours overtime for making phone calls and sending emails on his day off. January 22nd, the lieutenant documented seven minutes of off-duty work and claimed eight hours overtime. Sunday, January 31st, Edison accounted for 22 minutes of work and claimed 10 and a half hours overtime. He put in for overtime hours practically every day for a full year, even Christmas, eight hours OT. And there must have been some kind of police email emergency on New Year's Day because the lieutenant claimed 11 hours overtime. Last year, the PD launched a series of internal affairs investigations aimed at the lieutenant's time cards. Edison was informed, quote, it is alleged you have committed fraud by being paid over $40,000 for the first two months of 2021. In a memo to Chief Medina, an IA investigator wrote, quote, a reasonable likelihood of a criminal prosecution exists against Lieutenant Edison. Internal affairs concluded Jim Edison had violated APD codes of conduct, rules, and regulations. In February, Eric Garcia was the interim superintendent for police reform. How serious are Edison's violations in those two cases? They're very serious. Earlier this year, Chief Harold Medina acknowledged the wrongdoing. Lieutenant Edison uh, decided to claim overtime uh, when it wasn't appropriate. Uh, Lieutenant Edison uh, wasn't truthful with his supervisor. He was abusing the system. Edison was fired in November. Now, because any officer who violates New Mexico police standards can have their law enforcement certification revoked, APD is required to report Edison's misconduct to the State Law Enforcement Academy. Benjamin Baker is the Law Enforcement Academy director. The relationship that exists between the citizens of the state of New Mexico and the licensed professionals who are charged with delivering public safety to them is critical. Um, public trust in those licensed professionals is paramount. APD violated state law by failing to report Edison's misconduct. I've corresponded with the leadership at the city of Albuquerque Police Department alerting them to this matter being brought to my attention and the absence of a filed complaint from their office with the board. In late August, APD finally did report Edison's misconduct to the Law Enforcement Academy. His police officer certification is under review. End of story? Not quite. So if Jim Edison was fired last year, then why is he on duty today as an APD lieutenant assigned to the airport. And what about all that time card misconduct? Well, the city wiped it clean like it never happened. So how did it happen? Edison appealed his firing to the city personnel board. However, after he threatened to sue the city for civil rights violations, APD did an about face and decided Edison's misconduct apparently wasn't so bad after all. City officials negotiated an out-of-court settlement behind closed doors. Jim Edison was reinstated retroactively to November with full back pay and benefits. And just to make sure there are no hard feelings, the city handed Jim Edison something extra, a bonus check 
for $20,000. Edison will be demoted and his misconduct discipline will be reduced from termination to a two-week suspension. Disciplinary actions arising from the time card wrongdoing will be removed from his personnel record. It's a public record. I don't think you can just make it disappear. I've never seen a disciplinary record be removed. Tom Grover is a former police officer and attorney specializing in police misconduct cases. They did the investigation. There were findings. There was a final decision to discipline. It just goes away. Now, the lieutenant's firing last year was based on violations of APD's codes of conduct. Because Edison's time card activity may be illegal, APD referred the matter to the attorney general for a criminal investigation. So will Jim Edison be charged with a crime? We may never know. As part of the settlement agreement, APD agreed not to refer allegations of Edison's misconduct to outside law enforcement. And if a referral has already been made, APD agreed to retract the referral. Have you ever seen a provision like that? No. Actually, I haven't. Ever. When you read that, what was your immediate reaction? Well, I thought, well, how strange is this? How can you withdraw a complaint of a commission of a crime? Steve Settle is a retired state prosecutor. Facts are facts. And if there are facts here, after investigation, that reveal the uh, acts of crimes, the DA or the AG perfectly within their power to pursue those uh, w with uh, bringing of charges or an indictment. A spokesperson for the Attorney General says there is an active investigation of Jim Edison's time card activity. So why did the police department change its mind about firing Lieutenant Edison? Well, that's something APD just won't talk about. The Edison Settlement Agreement has a confidentiality clause stipulating the parties have no comment. Larry Barker, KRQE News 13. The city of Albuquerque will pursue an independent audit of Lieutenant Edison's pay records to determine whether his claims for overtime were consistent with state law. It was a Larry Barker investigation in May that exposed a tiny little error that no one noticed. That small government mistake was less than two bucks, but it cost taxpayers more than a million dollars. Have you ever seen anything like this before? Never. I was in shock. Yeah, it's, it's been a nightmare. How unusual was this mistake? It was highly uh, unusual. New Mexico's annual budget is more than $7 billion. So when a little-known state agency made a tiny mistake of just $1.74, nobody noticed. For a state that deals in billions, why do we care about a trivial error that's less than two bucks? Well, as mistakes go, this one was a whopper. By the time officials discovered the $1.74 miscalculation, that little mistake had monumental ramifications, impacting thousands of New Mexicans and involving well in excess of a million dollars. Ground zero for this blunder, northeast New Mexico's Koufax County, where Raton is the county seat. It was a slip up that affected every residential property owner in the county. Earlier this year, homeowners received the bad news. Property taxes had been miscalculated. More than 20,000 residents had been overcharged in 2019 and 2020. Today, county officials are scrambling to provide refunds. To understand how this happened, head over to the state capitol. What goes on inside the Santa Fe office building impacts every single property owner in New Mexico. The local government division of the Department of Finance is responsible for calculating what's known as the mill rate for each of New Mexico's 33 counties. Now, the mill rate, which differs from county to county, is the basis for all property taxes assessed in New Mexico. If a county's mill rate is wrong, 
then all of the county's property taxes are wrong. That's what happened in Colfax County. Someone at the Department of Finance miscalculated the county's mill rate. As a result, all of the residential property owners there were overcharged. We're talking about a mistake that was a difference of a dollar seventy-four. Yes, sir. And it was a human error. It was human error. Donnie Quintana heads up New Mexico's local government division. What was the impact of the error on Colfax County residents? So it was over a two tax years because it carried over from two tax year 2019 to 2020. So that's about 1.3 million uh, over the last two years that was collectively erroneously by Colfax County. Commissioner, when you first found out that this had happened, what was your reaction? Oh, I said, oh gosh. You know, I said, I said, oh, you know, we're, we're going to have to pay it back. Bobby Ledoux is a Colfax County commissioner. Anytime you, you pass a tax on to the public that shouldn't have been passed on, then it becomes a big deal, especially to me. So my first reaction is, we're going to do what we need to do to pay it back. Some 23,000 Colfax County homeowners are owed refunds from Angel Fire to Cimarron, Springer to Raton. This was huge. <laughs> I've never seen anything like this happen. Colfax County Treasurer Lydia Garcia is saddled with the responsibility of making refunds to county residents. This was a lot of work. And it does fall on me because we had to give the reimbursement. It's just a big error, a few glitches, and yeah, our work isn't over with. Now, the Department of Finance accepts responsibility for making the mistake. However, Colfax County also bears some of the blame. Under state law, each county is required to verify property tax assessments for accuracy before issuing tax notices. Did Colfax County double check the figures and catch the mistake? No, they did not. It's statutory that they double check the figures. Yes, sir. It only provides a good uh, safeguard, if you will, to ensure that when taxpayers are assessed, that the, it's been looked at at the state level and it's been checked and confirmed at the local level. Somebody in Colfax County should have been checking those figures. The assessor and the county manager should have been checking that. And that didn't happen? And that didn't happen. And what does Colfax County Assessor Christy Graham have to say? Well, we don't know. She refused repeated requests for an interview, and she would not meet with us when we paid her a visit last week. I'm sorry, sir, but she's on the telephone call with the state. It'll be a couple hours. She's doing her evaluation right now. She's going to be on the phone for several hours? Yes. Meanwhile, back in Santa Fe, Donnie Quintana says his local government division has not made a mistake like this one in some 14 years. We're very apologetic to the residents of Colfax County that this even took place. It goes to prove that every calculation, even as minor as $1.74, is impactful uh, when it's uh, our New Mexico constituents, our citizens that are impacted with it. We're lucky that it got cut and it didn't go on for more years. It went on for two years and that was two years too long. This was, this was big and I hope this never happens again. Larry Barker, KRQE. News 13. It is a firefighter's worst nightmare. Arrive at a blaze only to find there is no water in the fire hydrant. In August, Larry found inoperative fire hydrants all across the state. I can't think of any public property that would be any more important than the functioning fire hydrant. When was the last time this hydrant worked? <laughs> I have no idea. It's just a helpless, you know, terrible feeling. When these fire hydrants don't work, you are at risk. How long would you say this one's been out of service? Approximately 20 years. There's trouble along the border, and it's centered in the southwest New Mexico village of Columbus. No, it's not drugs or crime. You see, this border town of 1600 is facing a different crisis. A hundred years ago, it was Pancho Villa and his band of Mexican fighters who raided the town committing murder and mayhem. Today, 
it's fire protection. Obsolete fire hydrants that haven't worked in years. Here, here, here. Nicole Lawson is the fire department's assistant chief. The water should come gushing out, right? It should. This hydrant is on Highway 11. How long do you think this one's been dead? Uh, since before 09. There actually was a blaze near this hydrant. Yes, sir. Were, were you able to put out the blaze with a nearby hydrant? No, sir. We didn't have any available nearby hydrants. They were dead? Yes, sir. If you have a couple dozen fire hydrants, can you fix them all today? No, <laughs> no way. <laughs> Columbus Mayor Ezequiel Salas says it comes down to one thing, money. Uh, as far as funds, no, we don't have enough money to fix all the, all the problems that we have. We have to pick and choose our priorities. And it's important that we get these fire hydrants fixed. We need those funds. We need help from the outside. We can't do it alone. Absolutely not. Columbus is not alone. A five-year News 13 investigation finds scores of inoperable fire hydrants throughout the state. Many have been out of order for years, some for decades. For a firefighter uh, responding to a fire, a fire hydrant is everything. If it doesn't work, it's catastrophic for somebody. Matt Prop is the Valencia County Fire Chief. What's the priority for fixing an out-of-service fire hydrant? Number one. It's the number one priority. I know that there are literally lives on the line and properties at risk by not prioritizing that fire hydrant. Fire hydrants must be routinely inspected to ensure adequate water flow. However, if a hydrant is found to be inoperable, there is no requirement to repair them. Fire hydrants degrade. Uh, without proper testing and maintenance, they will cease to function. Milo Lambert is Silver City's fire chief and president of the New Mexico Fire Marshals Association. How important is it to get that fire hydrant back in service? It's extremely important. Um, they are a functional life safety device uh, that would, it is the equivalent of having a non-functioning fire truck or a malfunctioning fire alarm in a school, it's critically important. The village of Springer in Koufax County also struggles with fire hydrant repair. In 2017, this hydrant was covered in plastic. Why is this hydrant covered? Because we cannot get it open. That was five years ago. Today, the hydrant is still broken. And if there's a fire here, Firefighters will have to look elsewhere for water. The hydrant has been on Springer's repair list for at least seven years. In Gallup, we found broken fire hydrants scattered throughout the city. This one has been out of service for years with a broken stem. This one has no water. And even though this one has been broken for years, because it's on private property, the city cannot repair it. Gallup officials say they try to keep up with repairs, but contending with antiquated water lines is a challenge. And like Gallup, the town of Berlin is faced with faulty hydrants that have been out of service for a long time. Robert Noblin is Berlin's mayor. Does Berlin have the resources to fix all the fire hydrants that don't work? No, absolutely not. At a cost of seven to $10,000 a piece, uh, barring any any other complexities in, in the repair or replacement. Um, it, that's tough on the city's budget. That's a half a million dollars out of our general fund to replace all of them. And then there's Carrizozo. For the 900 residents in this rural Lincoln County community, daily life can sometimes be daunting. There's no pharmacy, the movie theater and the grocery store are out of business. The local newspaper shut down last year. And when it comes to public safety, Carrizozo depends on a network of fire hydrants to protect the community, like this one. Leroy Zamora is Carrizozo's fire chief. When I was young, before I joined the department, they told me that this was a dummy. It was never hooked up to the water line that I know of anyway. The hydrant at 5th and G is nearly 70 years old. It's an antique. <laughs> I don't think it's ever had water run through it. And 
Birch Street. Leroy Zamora Jr. is a town firefighter. Today, uh, does hydrant work? No, sir. It has been out of service now for about five years at least. The hydrant on Cedar was installed in 1954. Does hydrant work? No, sir. How long has it been out of service? Ten years at least. Fifth and D. But this one doesn't work. No, sir. It's dead? Yes. All over town, derelict hydrants, broken, useless. I have a list of each hydrant, its location, and how it functions. And from that list, you can see there are a number of fire hydrants that, if they were called into service, they would be worthless. Ray Dean is Carrizozo's mayor. We're fortunate in, in not having fires very often, but we know it's only a matter of time. Uh, the school, for instance, right? That would be a huge, huge tragedy. And I can probably take you to a fire hydrant next to school that's not functioning at all. As an isolated rural community, there aren't funds in the village coffers for fire hydrant repair or replacement. In January, Mayor Dean appealed to state lawmakers for help. You made a capital outlay request to replace the town's fire hydrants, $350,000. Yes, sir. Was that funded by the legislature? It was not funded. Now, earlier this year, lawmakers approved a total of $1.5 million for golf course improvements. However, not a penny for Carrizozo fire hydrants. I don't understand uh, why it doesn't have a higher priority uh, with the funders. I just, I don't understand that. The mayor says he'll try again next year. Carrizozo will just have to get in line right behind Gallup, Boleyn, and Columbus. This one's dead. Dead. Larry Barker, KRQE News 13. In March, a Larry Barker investigation that showed in New Mexico there are hundreds of obsolete bridges in such poor condition that school buses and emergency vehicles can't cross them. So where are those road relics? And just how dangerous are they? Structurally, what's that mean when you've got uh, two broken beams on this bridge? This is not a good situation. No, it's not a good situation. Does this bridge meet any safety specifications today? No, sir. If you live in Gallup, you know County Road 43. It's a shortcut locals use to avoid traffic congestion. Each day, hundreds of motorists cross the Rio Puerco here. However, if you knew the history of this bridge, you might think twice about driving on it. By what stretch of the imagination is this bridge adequate? None. Zero. This is one of our worst bridges in the, in the county. Anthony Demas is the McKinley County manager. I don't think it would even meet the bare minimum of the standards for uh, bridges today. Can an emergency vehicle cross this bridge? No. We'd be lucky if we get an ambulance over it. Uh, other than that, fire trucks, water trucks, tankers, school buses, it ain't going to cross it. Now, this bridge did not always span the Rio Puerco. It originally saw service in Vietnam, where it was used by the Marine Corps to move troops and trucks. After the war, it was dismantled, sold to McKinley County as military surplus, and reassembled outside Gallup. Even though this bridge was designed for temporary use only, it served as a river crossing here for almost 50 years. And just down the road is Superman Canyon, and the only way across it is another Vietnam hand-me-down. This is military surplus, and uh, most of our bridges that we do have are military surplus. How would you describe this bridge? Inadequate. Billy Moore is a McKinley County Commissioner. Is it safe for a loaded school bus to cross this bridge? Uh, no, sir. Will this bridge safely support a, an emergency vehicle? No, sir. If that house was on fire there, they would probably have to take an alternate route to get to it, which could be another 15, 20 minutes. In fact, more than three dozen obsolete military surplus bridges dot the McKinley County landscape. 
Although the county does what it can to maintain them, most are beyond repair and there simply is not money to replace them. We have uh, 48 bridges that are just like this. Right now, 46 need to be replaced. So of the 40 plus military surplus bridges here in McKinley County, how many of those are adequate for public safety? None of them. And it's not just McKinley County. This Rio Ariba County span was closed after inspectors found it to be unsafe. When this aging San Juan County relic was built 94 years ago, Calvin Coolidge was president. The bridge is still in use, but in poor condition. And following a freak rainstorm two years ago, floodwaters destroyed this span over the Cimarron River in Union County. Scattered throughout the state are scores of obsolete, antiquated bridges. So the last thing any of us want is for a bridge to fail. Um, or a bridge to be washed out. Secretary Mike Sandoval heads up the State Transportation Department. Each year, some $14 million is allocated to bridge safety. And we have a whole division assigned to that. Um, it's one of the few items in our inventory that gets inspected every single year, no matter what. And so it's a very high priority. We want to make sure that they're always safe. There are more than 4,000 bridges in New Mexico. Like this Quay County antique built in 1931. The only reason it's still in use is because of low traffic volume. Aging timber bridges like this one in Sandoval County are typical of many still in use across the state. They've outlived their usefulness years ago and don't meet current safety standards. Now the oldest bridge in New Mexico is not the worst one. The first transport across this Grant County structure was a horse and buggy. Built in 1908, four years before statehood, this bridge outside Bayard is still in use. The average age of our bridge here in New Mexico is 50 years, and when you don't repair these in a timely manner, um, it just gets um, worse to fix and more expensive to fix. A lot of bridges have several critical points to it, um, and so there's a lot that can go wrong, and that's one of the reasons that we inspect them on a yearly basis. Casual motorists driving across this San Miguel County bridge could not know the concrete supports are critically decayed. Until there's a replacement, heavy vehicles like school buses are prohibited from crossing. Bridge 5257 in San Miguel County was constructed in 1952, but over the past 70 years, Time has taken its toll on 5257. A routine inspection last year identified a troubling defect. Two broken beams were identified, which um, required immediate attention. Jeff um, Vigil is a state bridge engineer. engineer. We believe that uh, heavy load probably went over the bridge and cracked that beam. There were two such beams on the bridge. New support beams were fabricated to keep it open. 5257 is scheduled for replacement. And just down the road, 5995 was built during the Eisenhower administration. Water has infiltrated the structure, and that water has caused the concrete to deteriorate and start to fall off of the structure, exposing the reinforcing steel bars. It's safe today, but if not addressed, the structural integrity will be at risk. And just because a bridge is made out of steel and concrete does not mean it will last forever. Exhibit A, the 50-year-old I-25 span over the Rio Grande. Gary Kinchin is a DOT bridge engineer. We found six locations where the concrete directly underneath the, um, the beams, where the beams sit, is, has broken away. It's not something where we believe there is any imminent uh, danger to the traveling public, but it is certainly something that needs to be addressed so that it doesn't get worse and then create a danger. The price tag for this repair is expected to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. In fact, it will cost an estimated half billion dollars just to bring all of the state's bridges up to fair condition. Passage of the new infrastructure law last year will mean an additional $45 million a year for New Mexico bridge repair and replacement. That is a huge deal, and that's going to make a huge difference in trying to address these critical and poor um, bridges in our state. However, over in Gallup,
the McKinley County manager is not optimistic that money will flow this way anytime soon. You think you'll see a new bridge here uh, over the Rio Puerco in your lifetime? Honestly, Larry, no. We just don't have the resources. Larry Barker, KRQE News 13. In August, McKinley County was given more than $4 million from the state for their bridges. That money will be to design 10 new bridges and construct one. Larry is about to take us on a search for buried treasure. In November, Larry stepped back in time to follow the trail of clues leading to a strong box stuffed with territorial relics hidden away 150 years ago. I'm sure there once was a treasure chest, and frankly, I actually suspect that it's still there. I like to think it's there somewhere. I don't know if we'll find it. Someone may have found it many years ago and took it. It might be sitting in someone's garage somewhere and they don't even know what they have. Who knows? Ken Savit. It's a lost treasure trove buried in the territory of New Mexico 150 years ago. And even though X marks the spot, nobody has been able to find it. No, it doesn't contain an outlaw stash of gold and silver. However, the contents of the long-forgotten chest are no less valuable. Consider this. The day they buried a plain tin box a century and a half ago was an event so momentous it became front-page news throughout the territory. A huge crowd attended. A band played. There was a parade and lofty speeches from dignitaries. The story begins long, long ago in Santa Fe, near the Palace of the Governors. So, let's go back to 1867, the final stop on the Santa Fe Trail in the western frontier. The plaza, late October. It's a cold, stormy day in New Mexico's territorial capital. The Civil War had just ended. Tragically, 250 Union soldiers died battling Confederate troops at Gorietta Pass, east of Santa Fe, and Valverde Ford, south of Socorro. To honor their sacrifice, the territorial legislature authorized a permanent stone memorial on the plaza in Santa Fe. Territorial Secretary Herman Heath called the monument, quote, an object of pride, which as time passes onward, will become more and more sacred in the eyes of posterity. In October, a festive crowd turned out to witness the installation of the monument's cornerstone on Santa Fe's plaza. From the newspaper accounts, uh, it was a day to celebrate and commemorate. Rob Martinez is New Mexico's state historian. It's quite a vibrant scene in Santa Fe in October of 1867. Imagine that. There's music, there's people, um, there's this anticipation of a brand new monument commemorating Union soldiers. The territorial governor gave a patriotic speech and then a sturdy box filled with territorial relics and a cache of coins was ceremoniously, quote, placed in a cavity under the cornerstone of the monument and hermetically sealed for the benefit of future ages. During construction, wagon loads of limestone and marble were transported from St. Louis to Santa Fe. And six months after its dedication, the Soldiers Monument became a permanent fixture on Santa Fe's plaza. Fast forward a hundred years. To commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Civil War Monument, a decision was made to retrieve the box. It was 1968. The grand opening was set for Memorial Day. Armed with shovels and pickaxes, they dug and they dug. Technicians from Los Alamos joined the hunt with sophisticated ultrasound and metal detection equipment. However, the hidden box proved elusive. Five months after it began, the quest for a chest filled with historic treasures was called off. I would like to believe that it is still there. Eric Blindman heads up New Mexico's Office of Archaeological Studies. That early effort to look at the time capsule was uh, marked by the optimism of all treasure hunters, which would that it should be easy, 
and uh, archaeologists know that finding things in the ground is not necessarily easy at all. It's been 50 years since that ill-fated excavation. However, above ground, Santa Fe's oldest monument has not fared well through the ages. Time has taken its toll on the obelisk due to a shameful, racially insensitive inscription written by Civil War-era politicians, the monument has evolved from a symbol of patriotic remembrance to one of hate and discord. It took five months to build the monument. It took protesters an afternoon to tear it down. <laughs> Today, a plywood frame protects the remaining limestone pedestal. Santa Fe's elected leaders have yet to decide whether to rebuild the monument or replace it with something else. The historic treasure buried somewhere underneath has been largely forgotten. These are relics. These are pieces of New Mexico's history. Those materials haven't been seen in over 150 years. Cameron Saffold is a museum curator at Texas Tech University. At the time, there was a bunch of people that felt this was a very important thing to honor their veterans and their the men who sacrificed their lives uh, fighting for the Union. It's a opportunity for us today to look back at a culture gone and see what was important to these people 150, 160 years ago. The time capsule is a message from the past of our ancestors talking to us and telling us this is who we were. Maybe more important than finding the time capsule is doing our best to try and find it because our ancestors wanted us to find it. Now don't expect to see an archaeological expedition here anytime soon. The plaza is public property. Santa Fe would have to sign off on any excavation and the missing box is supposedly sitting underneath a massive limestone block weighing tons. How would you answer the question, where's the time capsule? We would begin careful excavation in the area around the uh, monument in collaboration with an engineer who could assess the stability of what we were working with. We actually could systematically expose the foundation under the pedestal and try to see if there are any clues to where the box might have been placed. Santa Fe Mayor Alan Weber's only comment? No comment. It's a mystery. It's a challenge and it doesn't have an answer. The box is either there or it's not. Larry Barker, KRQE News 13. To see a list of the relics in the monument's time capsule and a photo archive from New Mexico's territorial days, go to always on krqe.com. That is it for this KRQE News 13 special, the best of Larry Barker Investigates 2022. Larry has plenty of investigations he's working on for 2023, so stay tuned. Thanks for joining us.